good evening and welcome uh, to the sixth of these uh, sessions or gatherings reading through tracks and traces uh, and uh, this month we're looking at chapter eight uh, on Paul's uh, account of the Eucharist and, and a Baptist understanding of the Eucharist uh, and I'm not going to say much more because I don't want to take anything from James. Uh, so James is currently uh, a minister in Budley Salterton in Devon uh, he's doing a PhD through Bristol, but validated by a uh, University of Aberdeen, looking at Paul Fiddes and I think still William Kavanagh uh, around issues of Eucharist and other things. Uh, and so, James, uh, we're looking forward to you helping us get our grips around this another quite a long, dense chapter uh, and posing some questions for our conversation and discussion. So, James, over to you. Brilliant. Thank you. OK, uh, the church as a Eucharistic community. Um, so Paul starts his chapter, as you'll know, um, with a quote from uh, BEM, Baptism and Eucharist uh, Ministry, which is an ecumenical document, um, which claims that the Eucharist constitutes the church. And one of the questions he's trying to ask in this chapter is, is that the case? Can we affirm that from a Baptist perspective? And uh, he wants to make the case that we can, but only if uh, two other kind of subclaims uh, can be affirmed. Uh, firstly, that the Eucharist is in some way sacramental, uh, making Christ present to his people. And also, if participation or sharing around the table can be linked to membership of the Church of Christ. Uh, and so to explore those claims a little bit more, he says we have to think about three things, uh, uh, three meanings of the body of Christ. Um, body of Christ in the communion elements themselves, uh, body of Christ in the church, and a body of Christ you know, as the glorified Jesus. So starting with uh, the body of Christ as it's present in communion itself or the way in which Christ is made present to us. Uh, Paul makes a case that uh, for Baptists, we've always understood that the church itself is constituted by the presence of Christ in the gathered congregation. And therefore, if we're going to say that the Eucharist constitutes a church, it must be that the Eucharist makes Christ present to us in some way. Um, incidentally, I'm going to use Eucharist, Lord's Supper, communion interchangeably. I know there's nuance in those meanings, but I'm not going to try and pick those out now. Um, so we have to understand how the Eucharist uh, might make Christ present to us uh, and, and try and work out what's going on there. Um, and the first thing it does, as you should have seen, is, is fairly quickly bat away any argument about differences between ordinance and sacrament and the terminology there. He says that if you look through the historic writings, you'll find both being used often by the same writers, often in uh, you know, uh, consecutive sentences. Um, and though, so whilst there might be some difference in meaning, we shouldn't read too much into that. And it seems that certainly the earliest writings, whichever language they chose to use, always had some sense that uh, as we gather around the table, we are being drawn into some sort of communion and spiritual nourishment with Christ. Uh, and it's not this bare memorialism um, that we often find today. So with that in mind, uh, we move on to how Christ might be present. And it starts off with this discussion of the localized presence of the body in the elements. Um, obviously, that has uh, pretty much always, I think, been rejected uh, by Baptists, whether general or particular. Um, and whether it's understood as transubstantiation or consubstantiation, um, Baptists just haven't wanted to have anything to do with that. Um, and at least in part, he says, that's because of the difficulty uh, in reconcil reconciling the human body of Christ with his apparent omnipresence, both in heaven and on multiple communion tables around the world. So Paul moves on fairly quickly from there to talk about, well, can we understand Christ to be present more generally um, in, in, in the wider dynamic of the Eucharist? Um, for example, in the eating and drinking and he starts off by, by questioning whether we can say that um, whether it makes any more sense than a localized presence in the elements you know if the risen body of Jesus cannot be present under the species of the bread and wine then how can we be present in a different way uh, whether in communion or in the church meeting and then he very briefly talks about Calvin's argument about uh, you know it's the spirit who mediates between believers sharing in Eucharist and Jesus drawing believers up to heaven uh, and allowing Jesus to descend to us. And he uh, kind of writes that off fairly quickly on the grounds that uh, Calvin is relying on what's known as the extra Calvinisticum uh, and saying, well, Bart rejects that and therefore so probably should we. 
Now, I'm not a Bart scholar, um, but I, I wonder, and perhaps some of you, some of you will know better. I'm not sure he's being entirely fair on Bart here. Um, my, I think there's a bit more nuance to what Bart says um, in, in his use of the extra, but maybe that's something we can talk about a little bit later. But generally speaking, um, Fides is, is happy to leave that there with this general sense of Christ is made present in some way um, in the elements. But then goes on fairly quickly to talk about, or, or, or perhaps it's in the, the feeding and, and the act of eating the elements rather than in the elements themselves. And he, he again claims that both general and particular Baptists maintain this close link between the actual eating and drinking and spiritual nourishment or communion with Christ. Again, perhaps relying on this Calvinistic idea about the Holy Spirit making Christ present. And he says there is a bit of difference. Um, the whereas the uh, particular Baptists saw no gap, um, saw that this was an, an immediate nourishment uh, between eating and communion with Christ. The, the general Baptists had a bit more of a distance there, uh, but nevertheless, they, they broadly headed in the same direction. Um, but he says this began to be loosened um, in the 19th century as the Eucharist began to be understood as more merely symbolic. Um, and, and people began to perceive and understand that perhaps the Eucharist wasn't quite as distinctive or as unique in its making present of Christ as anything else that we do in church, whether it be the sermon or whatever else. It then changes a direction slightly uh, to talk about the presence of Christ in the body of the congregation. Uh, and here he wants to talk about the, the interplay in historic writing of this understanding of communion with Christ and communion with each other. And he says that is partly linked to the elements themselves, uh, but also takes place in the narrative recalling of the story uh, of Jesus' death and resurrection. Uh, and he claims that in telling the story, uh, the community rediscovers its own identity, uh, but also enters imaginatively into the saving events. And therefore, uh, just that the narrative and the story becomes a means of God making himself present to us and forming the community as his representative in the world. Uh, and Fides suggests that this is something unique that Baptists have to offer to the worldwide church, uh, rather than including the narrative in uh, the Eucharistic prayer, as many other traditions do, the story is told to the church uh, and therefore plays this key role in forming the community. Um, I've got a question there about how significant the narrative can be and whether it can be understood to be enough in the formation of the community. We can come back to that a little bit later on. Perez goes on to claim that to identify the body of Christ with the gathered community also creates the possibility of the church itself being a sacrament, a means by which others outside the church can come to encounter God. And he recognises that obviously this isn't uniquely Baptist, I think you find this in most traditions, but he says what Baptists do bring to the table um, in this particular part of the conversation um, is two elements of our praxis. Uh, firstly, the concept of the church meeting, um, which he, he wants to draw these close links between the church meeting and communion um, all the way through. Um, but the implicit assumption in the church meeting uh, that the presence of Christ can and will be known through others. Uh, and then the other thing he, he uh, makes a nod to, but then also raises some questions about, is Baptist opposition to establishment. Uh, and the possibility of the Eucharist forming the church as this alternative polis, so forming the church as a political body able to resist some of the power and authority of the establishment. And as I say, he, he seems to, to want to go there to a certain degree, and he follows, uh, it's Harvey and Thompson, isn't it, um, their argument there. Um, but he's also a little bit nervous about that, because um, as we see all the way through, and as we arrive at the end, he wants to have this far more general sense of of God's presence in the world and he's worried that to to restrict uh the presence of God to the church in this way and to claim that only the church can be sacramental might limit um our ability to see how God is present and making himself known uh through structures and movements of justice or whatever it might be outside the church so he moves on fairly quickly from there um and of course, he does want to say more widely, you know, he, he says if we understand the church is sacramental, then that should help us to to understand the sacramentality of the whole world. And 
sharing in communion should therefore help us to discern God's presence um, outside uh, in the bodies of the poor and oppressed in uh, ecosystems in nature and in all sorts of different places which brings us back he says to this question of how we distinguish between the incarnate body of Christ his sacramental presence in the church and in the wider world he then uh, changes tack slightly again to talk about the link between sharing in the Eucharist and membership of the church and he says that for the general Baptists there was always this fairly clear progression uh, baptism communion church membership uh, and therefore that you know sharing in communion around, uh, around the Lord's table was a marker of church membership um, he says that the particular Baptists had this slightly looser connection between the two and seemed to be more happy generally speaking uh, to baptize infants or welcome in others on slightly different grounds and we have this brief discussion here um, about uh, open table open membership and how these things play off against each other he talks there um, about uh, how for the particular Baptist this was often done on the grounds of church unity so not looking just to the unity of the local church uh, but the unity of the, the church universal or the church catholic and again he claims that there's something distinctive, distinctively Baptist about our understanding of unity here that whereas for many traditions including the Catholic or the Orthodox unity uh, comes through the bishop um, and, and the celebration of Eucharist in the name of the bishop um, but for the Baptists it's just anyone who shares around this table it is drawn into unity is understood to somehow be the body of Christ together and so he says that that if this can happen um, then th this might be a, an anticipation of the future unity of the church in which hopefully so many of our differences will be overcome and will be understood to be uh, understood to be to be one universal church together he does acknowledge though that um, open communion did uh, lead to a significant downgrading of understanding uh, of both baptism and communion and then he returns to uh, in trying to kind of pick his own way through this and, and make his own argument he uh, returns to this argument he's made in previous chapters about common patterns of Christian initiation so this idea that we are all on a journey of being drawn into relationship with God and the church and that whatever tradition church tradition we're a part of this journey will have key points um, including baptism and communion um, but that the journey might take place in different ways at different speeds and in a slightly different order and he says that this gives theological justi justification for for example open membership and an open table um, but he also says that even in within our own tradition we should be open to the possibility of things happening in a different order for example that someone might take Lord's Supper before they come to be baptized uh, and uh, he has a little section arguing that on this basis it, it's entirely reasonable that children should be allowed to take part in the Lord's Supper even if they've not yet been baptized or, or drawn into church membership yet however and again this is something we might want to talk about he says uh, and makes quite clear this should not be an individual subjective decision made by them or their parents uh, instead there must have been a point where the church receives the child and exercises faith on their behalf whether through baptism or infant dedication uh, and the child should also be enrolled in a group preparing for baptism in some way although he doesn't really elaborate on what that might look like but it seems that all, all the way through this section he's trying to draw a bit of a line uh, between someone being part of the community where Christ is embodied and uh, an actual member of the body of Christ playing a particular role and again that's something we might want to uh, pick apart and have a think about again in a few moments but having drawn out these different elements uh, so the presence of Christ in the elements presence of Christ in the congregation and this link between uh, Eucharist and church membership he wants to in in the final section pull together the, this bigger understanding of of what we understand actually by indwelling and presence and the relationship between God and creation uh, and it's here I think he uh, despite the historical sources he goes off in a bit of his own direction uh, not unique but certainly slightly different to where uh, most uh, classical theology has gone so he starts off with talking about the the issues he has with static what he calls static notions of indwelling um, and here he seems to have 
classic Christology and Chalcedon um, in his sights. And he argues that um, the way it's normally understood leads to this dualism of spirit and body in which the body is overwhelmed uh, by the dominant spirit. And he says this does carry through into this church, especially when the community is seen as the unique dwelling place of Christ. From there, he wants to talk about the, the social significance of bodies and trying to move away from this very individualistic understanding of the body, uh, instead to see the body and therefore the self um, as being part of these interweaving networks of relationships. Uh, you know, our identity is to a certain degree, at least communally formed as we inhabit these different networks. And he says, that if that's right, then it has implications for our understanding of indwelling. Indwelling can't be this one way infusion of the material by a powerful agent, but must be in some way two way and relational. And the way Paul uh, makes that work is uh, through his understanding of the Trinity. Um, he talks about the Trinity as being these flowing relationships of giving and receiving love, um, which in itself is a whole argument that we might be able to have, um, but then argues that that essentially that there is no ontological distinction really between creator and created. Uh, instead, within the Trinity, God makes space for humanity and the rest of creation to dwell. And so we come to occupy this space within the Trinity that is something like um, the, the, the shape of the relationship between the Son and the Father. Um, but it's also, this is an argument he develops further in other places, doesn't really go there in this chapter, which is frustrating. Um, but it, it gives space for us to dwell and be free, even whilst it is within the being of God. And if we understand it that way, he says, and that changes our understanding of Jesus. Uh, Jesus becomes this person whose life and actions map most exactly onto the son-father relationship in the eternal trinity. Uh, but we too can come to share in this as our lives are conformed to his. So when we say yes to the father as an act of obedience, as he did, when we share around the table and uh, go through these movements of breaking bread and pouring out wine, these fit into movements of self-breaking and self-outpouring in God. But in fact, wider than the church, wherever there are movements of self-sacrifice or self-giving in the world, they also correspond um, to this some father relationship in God, meaning that the body of Christ can also be discerned there. And I'll say there's all sorts of writing in this, uh, and, and he goes into a lot more detail elsewhere, but, but that's the basic shape of this. And so therefore, his conclusion is that on the one hand, only the church is a Eucharistic community and, and can rightly be called um, a Eucharistic community and the body of Christ. Um, it's uniquely by, um, formed by his story uh, and the sacraments which correspond to his life. But that doesn't uh, prejudice in any way against the fact that actually the whole world can be understood as the body of God and at times is able to be a sacramental means of his presence and revealing himself to us. So that's a very quick um, overview of the chapter. I, I hope it made some sense, but I'm hoping that you've read it and therefore you've probably got a better understanding of it than I have. Um, I talked about various questions there. I'll um, drop them into the chat and it's taken away all the formatting. So <laughs> it's like a big lump, um, but yeah. There we go. James, can you just quickly, thank you very much for that, just quickly read those questions for us. Okay, uh, so um, is the move away from a static notion of Christ's presence in the elements and towards this more dynamic sense of his presence through the whole rite a helpful one? Is Fidesz a bit hasty in his rejection of the extra Calvinisticum? Um, and what is gained or lost in his account as compared to the more classic accounts? Um, this one relates to that kind of narrative formational bit. Given recent criticism of the formational significance of Christian rights and narrative by Lauren Winner and various others, is Fede's argument for the narrative of the Eucharist as a place for encounter with God compelling? Um, is it enough? Uh, do we need to say more than this? Um, do we have any reflections on the connections he draws in theory and in practice between baptism, communion, and membership and the church meeting? 
how sacramental are our church meetings? Do we encounter God there or the demon of something else? Um, what are some of the implications of Fido's Trinitarian theology for his Christology, his nematology, perhaps, um, and perhaps even the significance of the church, uh, given this wider sacramental understanding um, of the world? Actually, what, what is the place of the church in that? Does it lose all significance, some significance? I don't know. OK. James, thank you uh, for walking us through that chapter, which, you know, as I said in, in, in the email that came out, this is the chapter that Paul wrote for the book. Other chapters had already been written in the past. Uh, and he's, I guess, trying to do a lot in this chapter. It's another dense chapter, uh, uh, whereas he had two on baptism. He's only got one on the Lord's Supper and Eucharist uh, and is doing a lot of work uh, in there. And thank you for guiding us through it and opening up some questions. So over to you uh, who were gathered. Uh, is there something from James's presentation or from the chapter or one of his questions that we want to kind of begin uh, our conversation discussion? Uh, I am. Um, I uh, will confess to um, almost total ignorance of Karl Barth's work <laughs> um, in a sense that I know Bart because everybody knows Bart, um, but not intimately enough to debate him with Bart scholars. And when people start citing Bart, I my eyes slightly glaze over because of the interminable footnotes. But I felt like I intuitively, when I read uh, Paul's dismissal of the Calvinist extra, uh, the I'm going to get this wrong, the extra Calvinisticum, it didn't feel right to me. It didn't smell right, if I could put it that way. So I would be really interested to know if there's anyone on the call who's familiar with Bart's critique of that and whether simply saying it rests on this defective Christology or defective account of the present status of Christ and the incarnation and therefore we don't need to consider it seriously is actually a, a reasonable argument and whether Bart has conclusively dealt it and blow or not because it didn't didn't quite sit right with me I don't know whether that was anybody else's experience but in that way that when it's not your field you know something something doesn't seem to smell quite right but you can't quite work out why yeah okay thanks Phil my sense is that there are very few Bart scholars on this school call that, that would know well enough to engage with this. So I'm happy for us, for people to kind of respond to that, but um, probably we're not equipped enough to, to engage with that question particularly well. But Tim, you have read some Karl Bart. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a sort of classic, like, juxtaposition between Lutheran and Reformed thinking um, and um, L Luther's understanding of the, the real presence of Christ. Um, uh, the, the, the idea, I mean, Bart and Bonhoeffer actually both discussed about whether the infinite can be contained within the finite. Um, and Bart says, there's absolutely no way that the infinite can be contained within the finite um, as, as, a, as a reformed thinker. But Bonhoeffer said, of course, the infinite can be tamed in the finite, but by faith. Um, and the extra Calvinisticum is, um, it's this, it's this almost this sort of sense of thinking that there's some way that God can be present in, 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 in created things within the created order in a manner that doesn't, allow God to be somehow sublating creation into himself. So that's linking a bit. This is from my understanding at least. So this is, Paul, Paul would say that God somehow, from what James has said, God, God is okay to make space within God's self for creation to exist, to participate in the divine life. Um, and Calvin, Calvin was very wary of having anything that remotely um, could enter into the divine life, into the divine nature, um, which is where he developed his doctrine of extra Calvinisticum. Bart, Bart would, Bart rejected that, but he wouldn't, he would disagree with Paul Fides in a sense of creation and creatureliness somehow being able to enter into God's self on certainly ontologically um for Bart God always maintains God's freedom God can only love creation because God is free from creation 
to love it. The moment that creation becomes part of God, God can never really love the world in freedom, if that makes sense, which I sense Paul would, would disagree with. I don't know if I've explained the extra Calvinistic very well, but that's probably what he's what he's doing with Bart. <laughs> I, I, I think, oh, as I said, I, I don't know Bart at all, but I, I think part of it is Bart, as we know, all the way through, wants to maintain this strong sense that Oops. Bit, 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 uh, strong link between the the Logos and Sarkos and and the Eternal Son, and I think his concern is that uh, the extra Calvinist is normally understood, um, perhaps enforces too much of a separation between the two. Um, but the, the little bit I've read about it suggests that the way, that where he ends up is in just trying to reframe the whole thing to try and kind of retain that link without rejecting the extra. Um, as I say, I'm not an expert in it at all. Yeah. There's a really good chapter, probably the best, I, I wish I had read it recently, uh, coming up to this session for that question, but John Colwell's Rhythm of Doctrine, um, he, he does a really good uh, exploration of the Lutheran and Reformed ways of trying to reconcile this idea of the, the the word made flesh and how how jesus can be fully god in a way that doesn't necessarily add to god in any in any way um uh, uh, but at the same time recognizes that in this human jesus christ god has god has been fully revealed as the eternal son and fleshed in time and space um he actually he actually agrees that the extra calvinisticum that the reformed and the lutheran ways of thinking aren't quite helpful and he develops an idea that well i can't remember how he resolves it in, incarnationally but he he develops this idea which i think he gets from robert jensen that eschatological speak eschatologically speaking jesus christ um, the human who who remains human after his ascension which i'd not really thought about before is now spatially located in the temporal eschatological future so he he and this because we have this idea that like jesus the human ascends to be with the father and then all of a sudden he like stops being human um and i'd never really thought about it before reading john colwell but i think that's actually a really helpful way of thinking about the continual incarnational sacramental presence of christ in the church and he's present by the spirit in the eschatological future um that's where dogmatics gets potentially a little bit unnecessary <laughs> and, and this is where i think the early baptists were quite good which basically said somehow christ was present but we're not going to get into the ins and outs of all that <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think that's, there's certainly a certain amount of wisdom in that like i i was at tyndale last week and there was a paper about um, responding to Philip McCormack's latest work on uh, the nature of uh, the relationship between the uh, persons in the Trinity, particularly as it pertains to the Christ and the Father, the Son and the Father, sorry. And my, it, it was increasingly obvious as the paper went on that it's just really, really, really difficult. <laughs> it's just really difficult to speak with any degree of clarity or comment about it. When you're dealing with with the nature of god outside of time and outside of creation and also then being temporarily located within creation and what does that even mean and that's really yeah. hard and i wonder whether that's what i i felt that paul's criticism of calvin was a little bit felt a little bit like a drive-by or something when he's making a real a real effort to actually bridge <laughs> that gap right he, he, he calvin's doing something which is really helpful so I, I, the more I read about this stuff, the, the more sympathetic I am to transubstantiation, to be honest, because it just it just feels like at least there's a, at least it's trying to sort it out. But but yeah, I wonder whether the yeah, that's, it's just really difficult. It's just really really difficult. And so I wonder whether we pick up some other bits of the chapter because I'm not sure we're going to resolve that one. I do think it was probably Bruce McCormack rather than Philip McCormack that you were talking. Yeah, about. yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, sorry, it was Bruce McCormack. Sorry, that's a that's a slip from me. Sorry. Yeah, no yeah. worries. Uh, other bits from the chapter. 
Ashley, what did you make of um, James's comments? I know that you've done some work around kind of narrative and James was wondering about how significant the narrative might be, uh, the work that Paul wants to suggest it does. You need to unmute yourself if you're going to comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I had to pull down my um, article to re read what I wrote because I'd forgotten. Um, um, and, and it has been such a long time since I've engaged with this. Um, I, I think that I, and I just tried to draw out the distinction when I was writing between what Nigel Wright, Paul Phillips and John Carwell were saying. And one of the distinctions seemed to be that Wright wanted a rehearsal of the story, um, whereas Paul wanted more of a participation and he made more of the word. Um, I can't I can't remember the exact pronunciation of amnesis or um um so um and i think james was i think james was highlighting that quite fairly that paul wanted it to, to capture that idea that we go almost go by sharing at the at the table we 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 are sharing in the first and the last suppers um i use the word first to refer to the last supper <laughs> and last to refer to the eschatological um um but i think it, yeah i i don't i, I was quite happy uh, i think with what james said i think that's what paul is essentially trying he's he's walking a line though isn't he he pulls back to this idea of participation um which is of course his his key thing um um and um and i and i i think he wants participation so that the church shares in the ongoing life and mission of god um it's not simply for the benefit of the church it's it's so that it's what he goes on to say at the end of the chapter about being a sacrament and and therefore engaging and meeting with god in the world um so but that's that's a little i remember um from what was eight nine years ago so i i think so, some, some of the reasoning behind that question you'll know there's been a massive uh load of people writing recently trying to make the case that uh, particularly the virtues um, and therefore the Christian community are formed through the rights and the habits and the practice of the church and it seems to have become the the solution to everything that um, you know if, we, if we're not seeing Christian discipleship happen in the way that we want uh, or, or would like then we just need to do more practices more habits more rituals and, and really get back to that and my feeling is there's definitely something in that uh, but there's also a, a number of people responding and making the case, well, that's great, but it doesn't work, does it? Um, just to be, James, because we've been doing exactly this for thousands of years and, and yet you, you, you know, yeah. you see cases where there's colonizers and the colonized sat around the table together, not yeah. apparently appreciating the irony of it. Um, and Lauren Winner and others have made various arguments as so I, I'm not sure it's what Paul's trying to say in this bit, but he, he does talk a little bit about formation uh, and forming the church as his representatives in the world. And so I, I'm, I'm just curious about, is just telling the story enough or should there be an expectation of something else going on here? Um, yeah, just and, so and, and is he deficient in his pneumatology here? Would, would the Holy <laughs> Spirit be the answer? Um, I just wanted to comment that my, my, argument, my whole argument, my, uh, my master's was that uh, uh, the Lord's Supper should be a virtue forming practice. <laughs> um, and that can be argued back from a, by looking at what Baptists are, are saying and doing. But I think it does fall over on the, um, so why have so many Baptists attended the Lord's Supper <laughs> for so long and never changed at all? Um, because, because but I, I, think... I, I think there are reasons for that, which I've tried to argue pre previously, but Andy gone. So I think alongside it is, I think, I think, our rituals and our rites, our sacraments should do that work, but alongside it needs almost, you know, as Paul hints at, but never really explains, this kind of the idea of the catechumenate. The kind of catechumenate is, is teaches you and trains you what it is to participate in these in these practices. So if you just participate in the practices without that sense of understanding of what it is to participate in the practices, they do no work at all, probably, or, or less work than if you're intentionally, consciously understanding what's going on as I participate in this practice. I guess open to the spirit more consciously that those practices might shape us more that I think I just think you have to be careful with that Andy um I just think you have to be careful with that given the um that we don't want to have an intellectualized um understanding of faith formation that that uh, anyone should be able to come and participate in the practices and be shaped by them 
uh, regardless of their levels of understanding. And I wouldn't want to push that that too hard. I, I think, um, yeah, no, yeah. I just think we should, feel, we should just be very wary of, of pushing that. I, I agree with that. So I guess my understanding is the meaning and understanding of the Eucharist and of baptism, and probably of other um, practices as well, are are you know we can never exhaust those meanings. So the sense of what it might mean for me as a 14 year old should hopefully be different from when I get to, if, if I've continued on a journey of faith following Jesus Christ, be different from when I get to 42. Because, it, you know, it's not that, oh, I've understood it now. Right? We're constantly being drawn into this understanding. And, and I think that understanding is both obviously intellectual, but also implicit. You know, this would come back to Paul, I guess, in the body. The body is doing something. I think it's the way we, I, I just want to bang this drum one more time and then I'll shut up. Um, I think it's the way, I think it's the way we do it as much as, as the understanding around it. So I think because we do it in such a, well, my view of is of Baptist, we do it in such a poor way um, um, that we don't have enough gestures for there are not enough movements, for example, in what we do. We don't do it regularly enough. Um, I think when, you know, um, to, to use a pedagogical idea, you, 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 you simply participate in in something um and if that something is very narrow uh, or very thin then i think your um uh, the way it shapes you will be quite thin but if that is is thicker if it has a richer aspect to it so if we made our baptist uh, uh, communion services whole services if we if we moved through that slowly and allowed different aspects of the the gathering the the taking the breaking the sharing uh to to, to be uh enacted in what we in the way that we share as well as as well as spoken about so if we moved around it from you know i i got fed up with banging the drum for having the, the piece as part of a, a baptist practice of the lord's supper but i think it would be absolutely uh, a factor that if we force people out of their chairs force people to face one another look at one another greet one another uh, uh, uh in, then you're moving towards a more a more embodied practice so I think I think it's the, the the thinness sometimes of Baptist practice that's the issue, not the lack of understanding. I'm just going to Tim before you come in. I'm just going to bring in Mark because Mark, yeah. you've, you've done some work in this area. Yeah, I mean, I have a lot of sympathy for what Ashley was saying about you know maybe we're just doing it wrong in that case, and uh, the, you know living with the the uh, sort of formative uh, deficit from that, but. And, and I think there is something in just wondering, you know, talking about not just the narrative, but but the gestures. Uh, I, I remember um, Fidesz's uh, chapter on ex opera operati in sacramentalism, Baptist sacramentalism three. And I thought there was I thought you, you should have gone further on that. I think there is just something about uh, what we do and how God acts in what we do, which would take us away in a way that would be necessary for Baptists from a kind of voluntarism with us at the center of it, just that God is acting upon us as we do these things. And that's why we just keep doing it. I think secondly, though, there's something about the sight of doing it or the direction um, that in terms of formation, you know, that we, we have this thing about what we do in church forming us for what we will then do in the world. And the, the idea of um, us as a sacramental community and therefore being a sacrament in the world just has that unfortunate thing of always starting in the center of the church in a way that I don't think scripture does at all. You know, that Christians and people of faith in scriptures are constantly meeting God in the world and then bringing that back into church. And so I think it's some, Mark, do you think some, then that Paul's helpful there then? Well, except for I think he, he uses unfortunate terminology like pro, pro, prolongations, you know, quoting, um, I can't remember the French oh, theology. Yeah. And extensions. You know, it, it still means that we start in the church mm. and we go outwards. And he talks about becomes a, we become a means of bringing God's presence or Christ's presence into the world. Whereas communion just might be a means of discovering Christ, you know, encouraging us to discover Christ's presence in the world. I, I remember once my wife coming home from a chaplaincy meeting where a Muslim lady, a Muslim chaplain broke chocolate 
and shared it with everybody in a time you know, time of great stress. And they had all got together, they'd done some feedback, and then this Muslim chaplain just stood there and broke a little bar of chocolate and passed a piece out to everyone. And Claire's first comment to me was, I felt like I was taking communion. You know, I felt like I was meeting with Christ in that moment. And I thought there was just something about that, that sometimes it just works the other way around. Sometimes we do communion so that we can actually discover that there are these communions in the world that are perhaps much more real presences, you know, encounters with Christ. So it's the, the direct reality of it. That's where I think Paul would be with you, wouldn't he? Yeah, except for it's just the, his language is so regularly, we do it here so that we can take it there. Whereas I think, you know, there's a much more of a sort of reciprocal at, at the very least, you know, that we are genuinely discovering, encountering Christ in the world um, in a way that is much richer, probably for the sort of thing, reason that Ashley talks about, much, much richer than how we meet with Christ in communion, you know, in the Eucharist, in church. That one is just the hint of the other, but it, it doesn't always start with the Eucharist, I think. But I, I think just on, on, I just remember something Colwell says about um uh that god may choose to meet us in anything but he mm. promises to meet us at the supper and i think I, but i agree with you i think you're right that by participating in the supper we learn to right. recognize those meetings outside i think that's i, I think, think that's... on that but on colwell i know we're reading for this but on Col that that argument i always find a, a bit of a bizarre one because there is in terminology of promise yeah i know he's on good sort of reformed ground here but there is as much a promise there are as many promises from christ, of christ meeting us in the world you know you could take matthew 25 as as clear a promise as you could um you know a eucharistic promise i i, I think it's a I don't think it's a strong argument at all. Yeah. Others who haven't said anything, you want to? Uh, I just want to just want to drop a drop a bit of a bomb. I I loved the way Andy you talked about how communion it just often seems very thin. I would go so far as to say the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper is anemic, um, because there's all this talk about the extra Calvinisticum and all that sort of stuff and we can sometimes spend years going to church sitting under the word sharing the sacrament with our brothers and sisters never ever have to actually rub shoulders with them and i think that's the problem i think i think we can go we can theologize left right and center about what we think's going on i think i think the power of practice is proven by the various things that i've read the problem is that the way that we form people through the eucharist is anemic and also i think many of the ways that we that that it is performative it is counterformative regarding the the way that we are supposed to be embodying christ and i don't think there's remotely as much what you might call christosomatic thought that's gone into how we approach communion because we don't think about the bodies with which we're sharing it um and i think i mean do we really think that if we sort of change the words a little bit that that's going to make people more likely to forgive one another i just think it's ridiculous um and actually if we are having communion we have communion twice a month one in a more traditional sense on a third sunday the first sunday of the month we have it as part of a breakfast fellowship where people have to sit with people that they would never choose to sit with um in the week and they they you see them you see the awkwardness which some people find themselves sat with another person like a person came to my church today who literally had shit on their shorts because they hadn't wiped their bum properly and they had to sit with you know uh, someone else who could smell them and then they come they come to sharing the lord's supper together and this person came up to me who had been leading the singing and said tim i just felt so convicted that i was so i was so judging this person but then i i felt like jesus really spoke to me and said tim like we all bring our rubbish to church you know uh, you know and and I, f forgive me for going off on one, but I, I just think I was really disappointed that Paul didn't say something that that was different to what I often feel is quite anemic with regards to talking about the Lord's Supper 
as this this sacrament where we are confronted by Christ through other brothers and sisters as we share bread and wine together. Hit me back. Hit me back. Okay, can I just ask a question to everybody about this? Uh, sorry, I'll get I'll, I'll get less. I've spoken already. Yeah, um, <laughs> as someone who experiences Anglican Eucharist quite a lot, because I'm based at an Anglican theological college, I actually, by the weekend, I'm quite looking forward to the simplicity of Baptist practice. And it seems to me, however we celebrate the breaking of bread and wine there's a danger of oversimplifying all the complex dynamics that are, are at play as has been pointed out already people whether they're celebrating the lord's supper in a baptist church or a eucharist or high mass in an anglican context can remain remarkably so it would seem unchanged by participation and I think we do have to bear in mind, yes, constant repetition of a practice can shape and inform how we think. That's in, that's in the context of being human beings who are flawed and limited and sinful. And it also poses the big question of pneumatology, which was raised earlier. To what extent are we receiving or resisting what God might be saying or wanting to do in us at a given point in time? And it seems to me that a lot of theologians in wanting to make the case they do, whether it's Paul Fidders or anyone else, tend to overlook that complexity. And I've tried to sum up the complexity. I think there's a lot more to it. And therefore, I, th mm. I think we have to be careful either about over cerebralizing or intellectualizing specific practices like communion. But we also have to be wary of simply thinking that if we add a bit more, we make it a bit more sophisticated, um, that that will solve the problem, because I don't think it will. Mm. I think Brian wants to say something. Brian. I'm trying to work unmute myself um <laughs> if i can but as i have been in these discussions in the past to sort of go back to the moment in my uh, life that i described the beginning of my faith journey when i was 17 and um baptized as i did mention um and then later confirmed in an anglican church uh, not too high but tending towards that position on the candle if you like but um when i first took communion which was at my confirmation something happened in my life it's okay it's in res in retrospect that i look back and say i didn't understand it I didn't understand the theology of it at all. Um, I did carry on taking communion when I went into the RAF. I, I used to go to the, the church on a Sunday morning, and sometimes I was I, I was recruited by a padre to serve at communion. I still didn't really understand any of the intellectual approach or the, the theological approach to it. When I first, and as I explained, when I was um, hijacked by a Baptist girl and taken along to a Baptist church for the first time and experienced the Eucharist or communion or the Lord's Supper in a Baptist church, I thought it was almost totally devoid of, of any kind of mystery. And I'm pretty sure that at that time, that was in the early 1950s at that little Baptist church I went to in Birmingham very very few people understood what they were doing there was rarely any kind of, uh, of, of liturgy about it no liturgical shape deacons prayed and they prayed all around the world it was a long time I think it was only when I obtained a, uh, started lay preaching 
and obtained a copy of Payne and Winwood that I began to find that, yeah, Baptists could have a form of liturgy and a meaningful way of presenting, uh, of, of, of coming to communion and the Eucharist. Uh, I've often termed myself as a high church Baptist for that, for that matter. Um, but looking back on it, when I discovered something that John Wesley said, that, that the, the Eucharist is a converting ordinance, I thought, that's what happened to me. Yeah. My, if I had a moment of conversion, it wasn't through preaching, it wasn't through reading the Bible, it was in the Eucharist. And I've always taken that fairly high view and in the, the, the churches in which I've been the minister, I've always tried to encourage that view of we are coming into a, 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 a real unity uh, uh, with Christ, but also with one another, and then uh, the question of taking that that relationship, and I think of from Paul Fiddies that uh, he, his participating in God has has helped me a lot. That participation, when we participate in the Eucharist, whatever form it's in, if we can approach it in a way that it means something to us. And if we can kind of share that meaning with the people with whom we're taking, entering into communion, and then taking that out into the world with us. I'm spending most of my time now, not in church, but sitting down at my local pub with bunches of people. Um, and sometimes when we're sitting coffee, eat, drinking coffee, to me, that's almost a form of communion. I Thank don't you. know if that makes sense, but that's Brian, where think, I'm coming from. Brian, I think something about there about mystery is something I think we lack in our Baptist practice. Yeah. Um, and here's me in the past who's advocated that children should be present and participate. I yeah. do think there's something about the Roman Catholic practice of first communion, of being prepared for it. And this is something, mm. something unique that we've kind of lost. Um, Phil, you wanted to say something, then I do want to see if Gareth or Stephen or Tim wanted to contribute in any kind of way. Phil? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to wait. Um, I, if, if, they, if they want to come in, I'm, I've spoken quite a bit already. Well, uh, say your thing quickly and then I'll... I'll <laughs> okay. Um, no, I think, I think, I think two, uh, two points. I, I do, I, I, I suppose there's a part of me that wants to resist the, 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 the move within... It's to, to speak with Paul, I think, in resisting the move towards viewing communion primarily through the lens of a, a formational or didactic practice. I think, I think, I think it loses something when it's when its outcome is primarily viewed as a, a means of ethical formation. Um, partly because it it's an, it, it, it misses to me the the the, the spiritual, the mystical aspect of of the sacraments, which I think is something which actually is really important right that we really do believe that god is doing something in someone when they go into water and come out again we really do believe that god is doing something in someone when they take bread and wine it isn't simply a didactic moment that they're another form of teaching i don't think i, I and, and 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 i think actually ironically the 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 the, the push towards anti-intellectualizing which i fully understand in those moments actually in, in itself becomes a form of intellectualism because it's still seeing the moment as not an encounter between the divine mystically transforming the soul of the person involved, but, 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 but it's something which is primarily designed to form them emotionally and mentally in the same way that any other didactic experience would be. So I think, I think there is, I, there's obviously a balance, but I do think there's a problem there when, when we end up too far down that. But the, the, it seems to me the placement of the of communion within the, the the standard liturgy answers some of these questions that if communion is seen as as a response to the to the to the liturgy of the word so its liturgical location determines to some extent how we engage with it and how the church understands its engagement with it i had an, i heard an anglican wesleyan friend of mine describe it as an article right he was talking in the context of revivalism and the critique of, which was coming of him having become more of a high Anglican from his Wesleyan colleagues, uh, that they didn't have altar calls in their church. He said, actually, we have an altar call every week. 
And the altar call is we're calling you to the to 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 the to the to the altar in order to receive communion as a moment of response to the liturgy of the word. Well, that comes back to Wesley's converting audience, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and, but and it's interesting that Wesley, of course, is speaking in a context in which the people to whom he's preaching are baptized, which is an mm. interesting nuance that evangelicals don't have. But and, and I think it, it's a deeper sense of conversion, not not necessarily of of this comes out. I mean, I've written on Wesley, and Wesley's the answer to everything, right? Um, but the the the, of conversion not necessarily as that moment of encounter where we receive justification primarily but as a moment of recommitment and of continually saying thy will be done in my own life yeah. and i think i think in that sense communion is like is a bit like the believer's baptism idea right it must have some measure of assent to it if it's going to be connected with discipleship and and that moment of continual conversion yeah thank you tim yeah i mean I, only to say that i found this discussion really really helpful i, I think that um in my own practice i've i've gone to considerable lengths to try to explain to people the the, the richness of baptism infant dedication marriage funerals whatever it may be the, these rights we have um but i, I confess I've, I've just always struggled i think with communion um and i i think i'm with this idea that telling the story is good but it it, it isn't enough it, it it doesn't seem to be formational although i i hear what ashley's saying about the the way that you can enhance that by, I guess, enacting or walking people through the story. So it's not just a simple reading out of uh, of a narrative or what's happened. Um, but I just guess if, if as Baptists, if we're a gathered community, the thing that I've taken from tonight really is this, I guess, this idea that if we were to participate in God, then we're having to participate in, in each other in some sense, if we are the body of Christ. Well, I, I suppose participate in each other either as, because we're believers and so we're part of the Eucharistic community, as Paul Phillips would say, or we're uh, participating in those who don't necessarily believe, but, but Paul Phillips is saying still can, can be the presence of God or the presence of God can be found in them. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to marry up this idea of us as a gathered community as Baptists, this, this, this participating in each other in real ways, which I think comes back to this, you know, Tim's and sort of shit on the short story. I think that that's very, very powerful, actually, about eyeballing each other, about really engaging with one another in some way. So I don't know what that I mean for my practice. And actually, as it happens at the moment, I almost never um, preside over communion. That's because of my role at the moment. But there we go. So maybe I've got a little bit of time to think about it before I'm back in the church and how to do this. Mm. Very helpful discussion. So thank you. I, I think Paul's point about the way that story is used is one that perhaps we don't we're not conscious of unless you you know as julian says unless you've been in an anglican church or a roman catholic suddenly you realize that story is used very differently or the narrative is used very differently gareth it was just his idea of story it suddenly struck my mind that the israelites always told the story of mm. um um of their escape from egypt and it became something that was repeated and it was an ordinance to them. It's something that they had to do to form their community. And in forming their community, they formed their relationship with God. And to my mind, the idea that we are telling the story about the Last Supper brings us into an encounter with the risen Christ. Yeah, Gareth, I think absolutely. And I think I would underline the fact that when uh, uh, Jews tell the story, they don't say our ancestors were slaves in Egypt. So they say we were slaves in Egypt. And I think I, I think that's where Paul is trying to go. And um, and I think what well, certainly in terms of the participation in the, the narrative, um, um, so yeah, I, I, I think going back to that is quite crucial. I think that is a, cl a key. There is a key link there, um, and it for me it isn't about just a virtue forming practice. By the way, it's about participation in a drama, uh, which is a transformative encounter, uh, which has the, um, the the richness of not. You know, it's. I, I would always summarise it in saying, look, for goodness' sake, we've just spent some time with Jesus. We shouldn't be the same. Stephen. Um, only a, a, a brief side comment, really. When I wasn't here with you last month, I was in the Lake District, and on the day that you were um, discussing, in the morning I'd been in an 18th century Quaker meeting, 
And uh, as you went in, it was a nice day. There was a lady sitting in the garden. She said, oh, I think there's only two of us today. So we'll just do half an hour instead of an hour. I didn't think you got in a good off, good time uh, for behavior. In the end, there were four of us and nothing was said. Um, and the presence of God was there. And I just wonder sometimes whether all our talk of Eucharist, di da di da, is because we have uh, ecumenically oriented ourselves towards Catholics, Anglicans, whatever, rather than say towards Quakers, Pentecostals, and that therefore we hang our thoughts upon a language that's not necessarily primarily ours. Um, not that you can't have either and, um, both and, but sometimes. Um, we kind of do make little space for those who don't understand the uh, the drama of the theatre and uh, reciting the story and all the other sort of stuff. But OK, so Stephen, with your Baptist history hat on, though, but Paul wants to say, I guess, that the 17th century were, were, were more Catholic than. I don't know, nonconformist or. I would depend wholly what you mean by Catholic. Um, I they. Both both sorts of Baptists in the 18th century or 17th century would have defined themselves against. Um, sure. And certainly if you read my, um, Michael Walker's stuff on the Lord's Supper, um, a lot of Baptist traditions, which you think existed from ever, actually came about as uh, reactions to the Anglo-Catholics in the 1830s and 1840s. And that's when some of the um, understandings of, of uh, um, communion, the Eucharist, began to become more simplistic um, because they didn't want to be seen as you know uh, as pseudo-Catholics. Yeah okay so Catholic might be the wrong word but you know Paul's arguing and others have argued and his pain would say that actually the 17th century were let me try this language were more high church uh, sacramentalists than obviously Baptists were by the time they got to the 19th century so what Paul and Ernest pain of doing windward going back to brian's comment we're trying to recover that i guess um which would put us perhaps more on the small c catholic side than the the quaker pentecostal side but i i, th I think your point's a really interesting one is that fair Stephen? or no come back yeah um it's gone now and everyone's starting to have glazed eyes by now. <laughs> uh, i think it, it, it's a much it's quite a complex um complex story obviously uh, in terms of the 17th 18th century um uh, you you throw in which they don't the, the idea of um discipline around communion and allowing people to participate or not participate in, depending on what they're doing so there is very much um uh, a higher value um not not again sacramentally but high value that if you don't behave you get kicked out of the church or at least you get kicked out of receiving the lord's supper which which brings a different balance to it um considerably also by i mean reflecting on the bits about baptism community membership and paul talking about the general baptists um by i don't know 1820s 1830s many of the generals which were on their way to becoming free christians or unitarians were doing away with baptism completely so so it it, it is a kind of a moving target as you go along i think there's not as often, there's not a golden age to retrieve. Um, there may be lessons to be learned. Yeah. So, so, but I guess we might say our, our, there isn't one story. There are stories, and it's it's more richer than complicated. So, you know, those who want to be memorialist, Paul and Ernest Payne would say we have this richer history in the 17th century. But likewise, we might want to say what, but that the uh, the practices that emerge in the 19th century and into the 20th are just as valid and important as something to recover and engage yeah. with yeah yeah and if, if i was being cynical <laughs> um the people who write with this richness of um eucharistic or um a, a wider understanding um do the people who come to their churches have any more deep understanding of what they're talking about than um maybe some of our congregations when they just sit together and think um i'm um, reflecting on my salvation yeah yeah okay yeah James, a final word to you, mm. if you've got a final word or something, just on... on, on... Um, well, I, I, well, I've got lots of final thoughts, well, not final, but lots more questions. Um, thank you, everyone. It's <laughs> been a really interesting discussion. I, I'm, I'm left reflecting mostly on kind of the, the, the boundaries of the community um, and how do we use the Eucharist to define the community?
and in our desire to be open and welcoming and all the rest of it have we actually lost some of the significance of, of why this practice is important and why we are this community with this particular identity um but that's a, a whole different can of worms so yeah yeah but, but thank and, you and, and that's where i think paul is interesting because he, he he does want to begin to blur some of that by the end of this chapter yeah yeah okay thank you everyone uh we're taking august off uh, we'll be back in September looking at what Paul wants to say about humanism, which may bring us back into some of these conversations uh, uh, again um, and find some overlap. Uh, so do join us uh, third Sunday of September um, to talk about uh, Paul's chapter on ecumenism, chapter nine, uh, and what Baptists might have to say into that conversation. Mm -hmm.